Okay. Your lighting is not as good as normal. It's also because you have like a part of your wall lit. I can't really tell what's going on. There's this beam and glowiness to your, what, what is going on with the beam and the glowiness? Yes. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, people, Pamela's asking why I don't, because, because if I have a light going directly on my head, I have just like a bright shine, a glow. So I actually have a, I have a, um, uh, cover in front of the light. So the light's going out to the side, but it's not coming directly down on my head. Okay. So that's all fine and good, but why do you have this really bright spot next to your door? Cause that's, where the when it could be because of my my um so <laughs> fine let's let's just let's just show how this works so <laughs> there's the light on the ceiling and i've got it blocked so it's not coming straight down on my head because that looks terrible and we ran out our house and we're waiting to get the windows changed so i've got like a big um uh light in the uh <clears throat> I've got a filter. What do you call these things? You know, you diffuser? hold it. What? Diffuser? It's a, yeah, I guess a diffuser. It's a, it's a reflector. It's a reflector. Um, and then I've got a light just down in front of me. And then I've got a light sort of bouncing off the wall on the other side. So, yeah. But I've actually got a new camera. So everything is going to change again. So I'm going to be using my Sony A7C as my webcam cool which is a totally different setup because this thing just guzzles light it's it's like happiest at like a twelve thousand um iso <clears throat> cool very cool oh, I might be losing my voice today but yeah yeah lighting for video people are saying on the in the chat lighting for video just sucks it just sucks it's yeah. just it's never fun it's always awful. The very best that you can do is, yeah, and being lit by the computer monitor. Yeah, the very best. Yeah. So, in fact, Pamela is actually lighting my face. I As I do. Yeah. As I do. Yeah, right there. Yeah. What, what I've determined is if I ever want to look truly awful, all I need to do is wear black, which is kind of my default color. Yeah. Because it absolutely does not know how to do contrast anymore. And as much as I dislike wearing pastels, that's what the camera wishes I should wear. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that whoever designed the contrast automation software is an anti-goth. Right. <laughs> that's funny. Um, <clears throat> I think you just have to, it's like with audio, like you just have to make it so it's not bad. Yeah. That's, that's what you're aiming for. I mean, my wife is a wizard at this. And so like when we shoot outside, she's just incredible. Um, you know, she's like setting up the lights and setting up the ISO and all that. And it's all perfect. She's so good. Uh, but, but we, because the, the office just where I record is in such a state of flux, it's just like, as long as there's some light on my face, everything is fine. All right. Uh, what do we do here? I forget. I think we record a show, maybe? Yeah, okay. And as a reminder, we do zero discussion of what we're going to talk about ahead of time. So I have merely guessed at what I think he might ask me about. So be prepared for chaos. Huh. Because I don't remember. Was this my topic? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. <laughs> I assumed that we wanted to talk about the more nuanced understanding of the rate of the expansion of the universe and how it's used to measure 
But we've already aspects. discussed that fairly recently. So I thought you wanted to discuss the fact that planets and galaxies and stuff aren't forming when we thought they should be forming. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Aren't forming when we thought they were forming. Like there's massive stuff in the early universe when there shouldn't be. Okay. And there's stars earlier than we thought. Mm -hmm. And Yeah, like did you see that interesting... Um, the cooling filaments? Yeah, there's, there's a thing where they, they were able to see like right to the edge of the reionization period. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, I mean, the biggest thing is just the 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 new radio experiments, the Murchison Array, things like that. Like we're finally able to reach into this zone that that has been quite invisible. Okay, sure. That's Meerkat. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. Let me know when you're ready for me to press the record button. <laughs> yeah, I was, I apologize. Like I, like, I feel like I put. Is that what I was? Was that the title that I set? I don't know. Hmm. It was. It was like a month ago. Yeah. No, I know. I I put in a bunch of titles. And then you picked some, but sometimes Nancy rewrites them and something maybe gets mildly lost in translation. Anyway, I'm perfectly fine with this. All it's right. A, it's a fascinating topic. Uh, we could talk about this for, for a while. Let's do it. Okay. Okay. Am I pressing record? Yeah, please press record. Okay. If we do one thing today, let's just press record. And then we'll just leave I, I have pressed record. I have also pressed record. Hello, Rich. Hello, Ali. Hello, everyone behind the scenes that makes us look less foolish. Astronomy Cast, episode 597, The Expansion of the Universe, Revisited. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I am doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Okay. Um, there's been a big outbreak of COVID here on Vancouver yeah. Island. It's been, it's pretty bad. Um, my son's high school had, I think, eight cases and they had to, oh God. And they had, they had to like quarantine about 90 people. Uh, it got into a nursing home here in the, in the, in the region, another couple of schools. So it's like the, the worst case of COVID. And I know I'd been sort of, glad to be living on an island far and away from everything but but we still you know have to keep our defenses up and clearly it broke through the defenses and has been uh been having <laughs> it's been having a party here on in a, in my part of vancouver island so yeah it's kind of a it's kind of a pain it's it seems like this is going around i'm i'm personally uh we're trying to quarantine our 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 different segments of our house my my husband got some stomach something uh last weekend not the one that was yesterday but the one that was a week before and ended up in the er and they had him unmasked and they admitted him to the ward and they transferred him between sections of the hospital unmasked Ugh. And they weren't testing people for COVID before putting them on the ward. So um, in the utter fullness of precaution, we're doing, okay, this is your quadrant of the house. This is my quadrant of the house. Right. And be masked everywhere else. Because unfortunately, like, you have to walk down the hallway to use the bathroom in right. my house. And so you're looking at like two weeks of, of caution. Yeah. Because yeah. for both of you, neither of you want to get this. No. No, absolutely not. Right. Oh, but we're here to discuss science, which is far more exciting. Before we do, this is your reminder. Newest guidelines are... My dog just took my headphones off. Those are not the newest guidelines. She can't hear me. Because her dog took her headphones off. I... I There's I no have... way those headphones are staying on. That dog is I... going to take them off every time. 
So I have an emotional support dog quite by accident. I got her the day I quit a job and she learned because I picked her up every time I was upset how to be an emotional support dog. <laughs> right. And um, she could tell I was upset talking about COVID and was simply trying to do her job. Um, but what I was going to say is the latest guidelines are wear an N95 mask or a K95 mask with a surgical or cloth mask over it. So all of you out there, stay safe, double mask. We're going to get through this somehow eventually. But before we get through it, we're going to talk about science because the science yeah. keeps going. It's been a while since we checked in to make sure the universe was still expanding. Yeah, apparently that's still a thing. But in the last few years, powerful new telescopes and expansive surveys have given us much more knowledge about what's happening, especially at the earliest times. We'll talk about that in a second, but first, let's have a break. And we're back. All right, Pamela. Now, we, of course, have talked about the expansion of the universe, the inevitable, ongoing expansion of the universe the at the largest scales, the, the, yeah, the eventual heat death that the time when all matter in the universe was compressed uh, incredibly close together. But every single part of this process is constantly being analyzed. And as it does, more questions pop up, new studies have to be made, new experiments are launched, new instruments go up. And so although we know roughly, you know, the universe is expanding, <laughs> There's like little pieces of this puzzle, like like hundreds, thousands of little yeah. pieces of the puzzle. And and scientists have been making really interesting incremental discoveries and advances across across the board. And so there's some really interesting new advances that you uh, that you wanted to talk about. Right. So so I want to assure everyone at the biggest, broadest brush scales of of understanding the universe we we have it we've got this <laughs> the universe it's, is expanding the universe is expanding we 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 see the cosmic microwave background that tells us that the universe came from this thing that we have termed the big bang we we understand that cosmo nucleosynthesis occurred we get the correct ratios of the elements coming out of the big bang where we run into trouble is anything involving detailed understanding of structure or what has happened since that cosmic microwave background was released. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so let, let's talk about yeah. like, like what, again, in broad strokes, like we know that we had the universe, the universe was a hot, dense state, um, cooled down to the point that in, in the beginning, it was opaque because it was so hot. It was like the interior of a star it cooled down to the point, roughly the temperature of like a red giant star, red dwarf star, that light could finally escape out into the universe. What came next? So at this point, our universe was a neutral gas for the most part. And it was more or less of constant density. But the slightest variations between that more and less constant density created places where dark matter and regular matter, the stuff we're made of, their tables are made of, could gravitationally collapse into a density capable of forming stars and galaxies. Now, the time scales that that happened on is our first point of confusion because really hot gas you can't collapse it down really hot dark matter not going to collapse down simply because the energies of the individual particles ricocheting off of each other through interactions are going to keep things expanded out against gravity trying to collapse things down but somehow at a time scale we're still figuring out things did collapse down. And this is where the chicken and the egg problem right. com comes up. And and just to sort of put a finer point on this, like we have this situation in the Milky Way where you've got clouds of gas, cold gas left over from the Big Bang, but it doesn't turn into a star because it's just hanging out there sort of per in perfect balance. Yeah. It takes some kind of kick, some kind of event. Hot gas, forget it. There's no turning that into a star. So how, what do we think now was sort of the way this all got kicked into place? 
so when we first discussed this many, many years ago, I, I said that we were trying to figure out exactly how galaxies scaled up, how, how soon small galaxies formed, how quickly small galaxies merged into ever larger and larger galaxies. And then we got the big telescopes built. And we started looking back at the earliest moments in the universe with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, with the Meerkat facilities out in South Africa, with, with all the radio telescopes in Australia. And we discovered that at the point that we thought the smallest galaxies would have just started to be forming a few hundred million years, 600 million years after the Big Bang, um, there's already perfectly formed massive galaxies hanging out doing their massive galaxy thing. So we had the time scales wrong. Huh? Yeah. How? So it, it appears that dark matter plays a slightly different role than we thought. The original thinking had been that luminous matter would fall into these big diffuse dark matter halos and form little tiny systems because there was no easy way to channel enough material into these dark matter halos that it could form galaxies. Well, apparently turbulence when material falls in and it's churning as it goes is able to give off enough energy that you can have turbulent collapse to form that massive galaxy. Okay, so we figured out the massive galaxy. And what's cool is we can actually see the cooling filaments from this hmm. in new images that have just been published in the past few weeks. But then comes the problem of how do you get a supermassive black hole to form fast enough? And here we're starting to think either more turbulence or there are theories that are showing you could do it with dark matter. Whoa, whoa, For whoa. years, yeah. Okay, I, I've got about a thousand questions and we'll get to them in a okay. second. But first, let's have a break. Okay. And we're back. All right. So, okay, supermassive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. <laughs> so, so supermassive black holes, which yes. are enormous black holes, millions of times the mass of the sun at the heart of every galaxy, blah, blah, blah. You've heard that a million yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. Um, and dark matter, we don't know what that is. Right. Can it turn into a, to a black hole? Well, probably, sure, because everything goes into black holes. How, how would you get dark matter, which we don't even know what it is, turn into black holes, which we kind of don't even know, really know what they are? what's inside them. How, how would this work? Well, according to some of the latest theories, if you take, say, a billion solar masses of dark matter particles that have a mass similar to the mass of a neutrino, and we're starting to think that dark matter is probably pretty similar to neutrinos in whatever configuration it is in, uh, if you pile all of that mass together, it will naturally collapse. The gravity will overcome whatever kind of pressure is supporting dark matter and allow it to collapse down into that supermassive black hole on time scales that match these youngest right. massive galaxies that we're seeing. I, I, I just want to have a tangent here for one second. Okay. And that is that when we talk about dark matter, we talk about this weird, invisible particle that only interacts with regular matter through its mass. It doesn't give off any light. And people people have this, like, I don't know, they have this response, this, like, immediate knee-jerk response. Like, that's impossible. I don't yeah. like it. Science wrong. But look at the neutrino. Yeah. Like, the neutrino is, like fits the bill for dark matter in almost every single way that it is essentially invisible o on average a neutrino will go through a light year of lead i call that not interacting with regular yeah, matter it fits. Uh, in theory they pack enough of them together have enough neutrinos and you'll have yourself some gravity like like if you're okay with being fine with the idea of neutrinos 
that the which only, we detect on a regular which basis. we detect on a regular basis, but 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 we're very difficult, and we're only detected yeah. fairly recently with enormous experiments. And yeah. up until that point, they were just entirely theoretical; just the math predicted them. That that if you have a problem with dark matter, but you're okay with neutrinos, like it's really they're almost the same thing. Um, it's it's funny. It's just that one has been detected and the other hasn't, and. And now, the one has a name that sounds like a particle that sounds and the like a other particle. sounds yeah. like it was made up. So is that the problem that we just, the I dark matter so. just doesn't have like a really cool name? Yeah, yeah, I'm willing to go with that. It sounds like a sci-fi show. In fact, the name was used for a sci-fi show. I know, show. I know. So, okay. I, I just, I can feel like I'm finally, I've, I've just developed a new way to, to talk about this. Um, so, so then I guess the, the point being like, we know that dark matter doesn't, interact with regular matter and it doesn't interact with itself either yes so the only way that you could make this happen is if it was just in the same region at the same time it, with enough density to create a black hole and and that is exactly what it is anytime you get enough mass together that the gravitational attraction in towards the center can overcome whatever form of pressure is supporting the material it will collapse into potentially a black hole. And in this case, it does it on the correct time scales, in the correct amounts of mass, and it just makes sense. And the idea is that dark matter, which is the bulk of the universe, was able to fall into a dense enough halo that it could collapse into a black hole faster than all that luminous stuff that's coming in from way further away right was able to collapse down and would be getting pushed back based on the heat exactly right really interesting. and and it all comes down to the density of the stuff throughout the universe right what else have you got for us <laughs> so so we've also been trying to work out the details of how do you take a universe made of neutral gas, which is pretty opaque, you can't look through it, and you turn it into this transparent universe that allows us to look billions and billions of years across space and time to see all this stuff happening? And we tried blaming quasars, we tried blaming star formation, but we needed data to do it. And the amazing thing is we're finally starting to be able to build the telescopes that work from the surface of our planet to figure this out. This was supposed to be done by the JWST, which has refused to launch October, for the past October 31st, years. it's going to happen. We're like, we're only like nine months away now. It's told, not even seven months away. So and how happen. long will it take to be fully commissioned and working? Like a day. <laughs> It's going to take longer than that right, to get from the right, surface fine. of the Earth to its orbit. But so so all of this really cool science was supposed to be done with the Atacama LART. Not sorry. All this really cool science was supposed to be done with the James Webb Space Telescope. And we're an impatient lot, us <laughs> astronomers. And when you refuse to finish building our space telescope, we start finding other ways, apparently. I haven't. I bear no responsibility for this. People far better at engineering than I am have figured out how to build ground-based telescopes working in ra radio waves, submillimeter waves. And as they ply these longer wavelengths of light, they're looking back to the beginning of the universe and they're starting to be able to measure massive star formation. They're starting to be able to see how it literally was those first stars lighting up that made our universe transparent. But what was also really cool is you end up with bubbles of material getting pushed out by early supernovae. So it's this one-two punch of material getting pushed out as well as the illumination from the stars. All right, we'll talk about that some more in a second, but first, it's time for another break. And we're back. So I, I, lo I do love this idea that, that astronomers find a way that, that, that even if 
the telescope that they're depending on to peer into the dark ages of the universe takes, I don't know, like a decade longer than expected, um, that they come up with an entirely new technique using a earth based, fairly inexpensive radio telescopes, it's a large array of them sitting in the in the desert of, of South Africa to see this time. So what is the technique that they're that they're using? It's it's interferometry. It's a way of taking the light from multiple different small scopes and combining it together to create a much more high resolution ability to look at things. The the amount of detail you can see in anything is determined by how big it is from edge to edge, but it doesn't have to be complete from edge to edge. So you can take a mirror and turn it into a honeycomb and its ability to detect details will be exactly the same as when it was a solid piece of glass. It's gonna weigh a lot less and take up a whole lot less space. With optical telescopes, we don't generally do that, but with radio, we will scatter telescopes all over an entire continent, sometimes, sometimes all a over. Sometimes planet. Yeah, exactly. And you don't want to cover that much ground with radio equipment. So to get these very high resolution images, they're combining telescopes spread out over miles and kilometers and kilometers and miles. And each telescope is able to gather a certain amount of light. And because there's enough of them, they can also detect very faint signals. So you have the amount of collecting area gives them faint. The edge to edge size gives amazing resolution. Put it all together, find a tunnel that is mostly empty between here and some distant object. And finally, you can see that distant object. And I want to talk just a little bit about the about the technique that they're using. Um, I mean, are they going after the 22 centimeter line specifically or? No. So what they're actually doing is they're looking for some of the ionization lines that come from star formation. So we we start seeing the hydrogen 21 centimeter line. That's that's the wavelength of the light we see that's coming from hydrogen gas and large diffuse clouds. We're not interested in those clouds in the early universe. We know those are there. Mm -hmm. We're interested in figuring out what ionizes them and makes it so that we can see through everything. And this is where understanding how the light comes off of bright stars really starts to matter. When we look at starlight, we can divide it out into a rainbow. And we're gonna see dark spots in that, that rainbow, which is where light is getting absorbed out by the atmosphere of the star. But we're also going to see bright lines, either from nearby gas that is getting ionized, or in some cases, actually, from some of the stars will have ionization lines. It's those bright lines, those emission lines that, that we're looking for because, well, first of all, they're brighter, so they're easier to see at these kinds of distances. But they're also specifically signifying this kind of star formation is going on. Right. This is what is illuminating the universe. Come look at me. Right. Okay. So, so, so that's the technique. What have they been able to find in? What are the, the new discoveries they've been able to make in this period? Well, what we're finding is there is complex structure around these galaxies of how the gas is is getting made transparent. We have exploding stars that are able to shock the gas and create bubbles, essentially blowing bubbles. So that's one way you get a lower density area that is much more easy to ionize. And this can also blow bubbles that clear out passages from the galaxy, essentially escape routes. And then we're also seeing that the star formation itself is so hot and so bright that it can push the material out around it. Now, over time, we're also going to get the cores of the galaxies going where a disk of material around supermassive black holes, it will also get very hot and bright. And it clears out the region around it as well. So we have all these different mechanisms coming together. This is one of those amazing cases of both and. 
all these different things keep get happening. And the crazy thing is when you read the papers, a lot of times it comes across as, and we have shown that the universe was reionized by star formation. And we have shown the universe is reionized by active galaxies. It's all these things. The universe refuses to take limits. It has no boundaries. It's going to do amazing things its way. Right. Yeah. It's just our job to to uncover it. What what are some interesting, I guess, experiments or observatories that are coming up in the near future that will sort of continue to push our knowledge of this this early time? Well, a lot of these radio telescopes are pathfinders to the eventual square kilometer array, which is divided across two continents with some of its dishes at some wavelengths. And dishes is a bit of a stretch for the square kilometer array. It looks more like spiky bits out in the desert. Um, it, some of the detectors are going to be put in South Africa and other Southern African nations, and others are going to be put in Australia. Uh, these two sets of arrays are going to be working at slightly different wavelengths. And they're going to have a massive collection area and a massive resolution, and they're working at these extremely long wavelengths that with these objects being very redshifted, will give us the ability to see further back than we're currently able to see a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I think we'll be doing eventually dozens of shows on discoveries made about the uh, about the square kilometer array. It's going to be amazing. Thank you, Pamela. My pleasure. All right, did you have some names for us this week? I do. Um, so as, as always, we're here thanks to the generous contributions of people like you, Rich, Annie, Nancy, not Annie, Allie, I'm so sorry, Allie, Rich, Allie, Nancy, all the people behind the scenes, Beth Johnson, um, everything they do is, is because of your contributions. And this week I would specifically like to thank brand new paid a year in advance uh, sponsor Kevin Lyle, David, Nate Detweiler, Philip Walker, Elad Avron, Matt Rucker, Joshua Adams, Dave Lackey, George, Gregory Singleton, Paul D. Disney, Karthik Venkatraman, Cooper, Lou Zealand, Sarah Tumball, Chris Schauerhofer, G4184, Matt Newbold, Father Prax, Stephen Shewater, Dean McDaniel, and Planetar. So thank you all so much for everything you've done to keep us going. Thanks, everybody. All right. And now we save, and now we answer your questions. Yeah. And I had requests from Twitter for doggos on camera. Stella. Come here, Stella. <laughs> Malachi's like, I'll come. Okay, so he doesn't want to come completely. So let's see what I can do to show Malachi. There is Malachi. Look out. Look out. He's like, I'm not going to look up. I tried, people. I tried. Okay, so what science requests do we have? Okay. Oh, I totally screwed up my camera. Zach Perry asks, as time and space are intrinsically linked to space-time, when the universe expands, does time expand in some way too? Whoa. So, Dude. So the rate at which time passes is dependent on your velocity through space. If space itself is expanding, that is a separate variable. Um, so if you assume that you are constant relative to some non-existent rest frame, right. Yeah. Um, then no time won't be affected. Now, the thing is we all do have motions. 
and there is no rest frame. So no two So you two always have to ask compared to what? Yeah. So no two individuals are seeing time in the exact right. same way. Yeah. Um, we just can get pretty darn close to one another, but we never experience it the same way. Um, I, I probably mentioned this stat before, but, but – uh, and Brian Coberline told me this, and so I just have to assume it's true, um, which is that we're – Different areas of the universe are up to 30,000 years different based on on time dilation. So That's if you're cool. on one side of the observable universe and then you're on the other side of the observable universe, you can be uh, 30,000 years apart. And, and there's just ridiculous things that you have to take into consideration going from what is my velocity traveling around the earth? What is my velocity traveling around the solar system? What is yeah. the velocity around the galaxy through the local group? All these different things change the count of time. Right. Arjun asks, could we use the Event Horizon Telescope to help the square kilometer array? Um, I don't think they work at the same wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Let me rephrase that. I know they don't work at the same wavelengths, so no. But could you do, I mean, we see images of, of like the Chandra and Spitzer looking at the same object at the same yeah, time. Yeah, so you can do stuff like that. Yeah. Um, the Event Horizon Telescope is working at much shorter wavelengths, so it would be a very different image. Raj Luther asks, does the expansion of the universe affect the accurate measurement of the age of the universe? Is the universe infinite or is there a boundary? So there is a beginning. There is not, as far as we know, an end. In terms of time. Uh, yeah. Um, and the beginning gets kind of squirrely depending on what cosmologist you talk to. We're going to ignore that part. Right. Um, what was the question again? I'm well, sorry. Well, so I got does lost the expansion the of the universe affect the accurate measurement of the age of the universe? So does the expansion ch ch mess up our ability to measure its age? So it shouldn't. Um, it should be that because we can look at how is this volume of space behaving, how is this next volume of space beginning? Uh, expanding by being able to look at progressive different volumes at different distances we should be able to figure out what's going on as a function of time now the problem is is that requires accurate ways to measure distance that is separate from measuring expansion and that we're still struggling with and it also assumes that the physics stays the same across all of time. And there is this weird discontinuity in how we measure the expansion rate um, between the earliest parts of the universe right. and the more recent parts of the universe. And everything involving the early parts matches, everything involving the later parts matches, and the two parts do not match right. each other. And so either our theories are wrong or the universe did some changes in in expansion speed at some point that's messed it up and or there's just a term in the physics we don't know right um let's see Lillian Brennan asks, that's an interesting mug. How does it retain the heat of a drink compared to a standard cylindrical mug? Um, Let's see the mug. It's uh, it's from one of those subscription box services that buys things Wait. Uh, at fair market rates. Is there a – does the shape of a mug affect its thermal? Yes. What? Yes, it does. So this bottom part that's more spherical actually cools much faster because the surface area to volume ratio is maximized. Um, that said, it is much more effective for warming my hands. Right. But I'm just saying like in general, like does yeah. a cylindrical shape of a mug, is that the you... optimal shape as opposed to say a square like, I understand, like, it's easier. I, I just figured it's about making them. Like, it's easier to make a cylindrical 
mug and I said that wrong. Sorry. It pottery. retains it retains heat more effectively because you have the minimum surface right. for the maximum volume. I said it backwards. Right. So the sphere is the optimal shape. Right. And um, maximum it, volume, minimum surface area. Yeah. Right. So if you have a cylindrical mug that's a really skinny, tall cylinder, it will cool off substantially faster. So you want to minimize your surface area to maintain the heat within the mug. Now, ideally, you want a double walled mug or some form mm -hmm, of insulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you want the fluid to stay warm, if you want your hands to stay warm, right. ceramic's fine. Right. So this this works sure quite that's nicely. The purpose of a mug, maybe. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. Um, great question. All right. Kevin N, with the report of the highly energetic neutrino discovered in the ICE telescope, any thoughts if this event will give scientists new ideas for discovering more with other methods? So, so that was the most fascinating day in reading research papers. There was two papers that came out, both looking at neutrinos in ice cube. Yep. One, they were able to very precisely identify the location, and the other one, they did general hand wavy for a whole bunch of neutrinos and said, we think it comes from... Quasars. The... Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it was something. like definitive. Yeah. They all come from quasars. Come from... And then the other one was just like a black hole ate a star. A regular everyday black right. hole ate a star. It produced this neutrino. We yeah. saw the flash of light. And so to have two papers on the same day where the one is this one terra electron volt neutrino, was it terra? Or it was a terra, yeah. 200, yeah, it was a 200, 200, 200 terra, terra yeah. electron volt neutrino came from this specific event that was in the outskirts of a galaxy. A star got eaten. Then the other paper, which was written in general, said from examining all these events, yeah. High energy neutrinos above 200 tera electron volts all come from blazars. And it was like, you can't both be right. Um, a and black hole false... eating a star or the accretion disk around a black hole. So, so, so Aren't the they kind one was of the same. No, but it, it's, it can be a case. And this is where, again, you need to not limit the universe because the universe will not be put in a box um you you can say the bulk of neutrinos seem to most likely come from the energetic environment involving the jets of blazars it wasn't the accretion disk it was the jets that was doing the acceleration right and leave space for the occasional stellar mass black hole to just shred a star right in that in that the the jet of a supermassive black hole is ludicrously powerful yes. compared to a single star dis getting dismantled by a black hole. That's merely right. really powerful as opposed to ludicrously powerful. Well, the physics of how they're giving off all the energies is different. Well, let's talk about that then. What is the, what is the physics of the one that's being hurled at you by a quasar? So that involves magnetic fields accelerating particles. And then the shredded star is gravity shredding a star. But where is the neutrino coming from? Uh, so the neutrino is coming from uh, the individual particles coming apart in the jet due to collisions. And I have no idea in the star exactly what, what where the it's exact, coming from. Right. But, yeah. but I mean, we know that, that even stellar mass black holes have very powerful magnetic fields. Yeah. So interesting. Yeah. It's just enough different that, that like if it was the accretion disk of a black hole versus the accretion disk of, of a supermassive black hole, yeah. I'm good with saying it's the same thing, but where the, root cause of particle shredding is gravity versus magnetic field. I'm not quite as okay saying it's the same thing. Right. Um, June asks, do you have any recommendations for astronomy inspired posters, artists in general? Um, I paint, I paint planets. So you, um, then the SETI Institute has an entire Facebook group 
of space related artists. That's a yeah. really cool resource. Um, beyond that, I honestly will go to Etsy and just enjoy the glorious stuff on Etsy because that's where a lot of the artists are. Mm. Um, Amy Hill is a ceramics artist who does breathtaking um, tea kettles and mugs that are nebula and landscapes. Amy Davis Roth, who does a whole lot of different stuff, has um, not realistic, but science themed where mm -hmm. it's rockets and spacecraft. Um, I like Aaron else? Wood. He does. He's the one who did the posters of the yes. planets that I've got behind. Yes, he also, he also exactly. custom did this Gravity Walls are for Suckers poster for me. Yeah, um, his he's currently taking a break during COVID times. But yes, yeah, um, just, you can see him at just bunch. one scarf at. Uh, yes, but there's I mean, there's so many. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many. NASA does some great posters, actually, with like the different planets, Kepler and and the Kepler's discovered with some of the really extreme places. Yeah, sort of saying like you can t go on an interesting vacation to some of these worlds. So, um, and, and any of you who are following us on Patreon, um, I basically yesterday did a, I've been trapped in my house for one year and I survived because of the internet here, have a coupon to my Etsy store. So if you follow us on Patreon, um, you received a coupon. If you do not currently belong to our Patreon community, well, join, join and Get a coupon because I have spent a year trapped in my house. Me too. I've been less <laughs> trapped, but still trapped. Yeah. Uh, Horizon Brave asks, this may be off topic, but we don't hear anything about the particle collider at CERN. What's next for it? Is it still doing science or large scale future experiments? Um, I think it's currently in shutdown yeah. as they prepare to go to higher energies. Yes. So they are in... They are in between science runs, which is why you're not hearing anything from it. But we actually heard, we got a, it was funny. We, we got a bunch of invitations to go see yeah. CERN. They're like, oh, you, you know, we're, we're offline. You should come and this is your chance to come and take a tour and oh, da, da, da. Right. And then COVID. Yeah. It's just like, I actually was even like, we were kind of thinking like, yeah, we should totally do it. Let's I go. I really wanted to go. Yeah. Yeah. And then COVID. Uh. Yeah. Just add that to the list of interesting adventures that have had to be postponed. I still am grateful that the last trip that we all did was us in Hawaii. Yes. That was a good last trip a to year have. Ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was exactly one year ago yesterday that I made my last grocery store run. Oh, really? And <laughs> yeah. I like overfilled the cart with all the staples and um, the grocery store had apparently just figured out that things were coming down because they had just put up all of their basic items, uh, buy, buy three, get two free type stuff. And yeah, since then, I've left the house about 10 times. Right. I, I, go out, I go out once a week and I'm trying to push it to once every two weeks. I've gotten incredibly organized. So... I have a shopping list. I hit a couple of, I hit about three different places to sort of pick up everything that we need. Drugstore, the recycling depot, a couple of grocery stores. I'm done with it about two hours and then I don't go back out again for two more weeks. It was funny, yeah. we were talking about this last night. We're like, do you remember eating at restaurants? When was the last time we ate at a restaurant? And from what we can yeah. tell, the last time we ate at a restaurant was probably like April maybe March, April of last year. So we're, we're closing in on a year of, of not going to a restaurant. Yeah. So for us, it was last time we went to a restaurant was in Hawaii. <laughs> right. I think it, so like the last time you went to a restaurant was when we went to a restaurant in Hawaii. Okay. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> um. Let's see. So I, and 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 I think it's going to be a thing that I continue doing. Like I'm, I'm so happy with how organized many of these procedures have become. That See, I I wouldn't be surprised. Like, like I'm just like I'll just keep going once every two weeks. What, I used to what go I'm all the time. 
what I'm finding is I am being much more conscientious in how I buy things. Um, so I'm buying things from places where I can get it with uh, more um, recycled materials, mm -hmm. with uh, it gives back to the community, with just all sorts of different, okay, how can I make my purchase matter more? Because mm -hmm. it has to get brought to my front door anyways. But the thing I miss is like, I really want to go to the bike store and figure out exactly which of two models of bikes is the one that I really want to buy. Yeah. And I can't do that. <sighs> yeah. So. Yeah. You want to be able to like try them out, go for a ride, come back, try the other one, go for a ride, come back. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I'm actually thinking of getting a new road bike because I kind of, um, I've been doing a lot of road riding, but on my mountain bike and it's sort yeah, of Yeah. Like, that doesn't know. Yeah. Yeah. I actually kind of hurt myself actually. Oh no. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I did a lot of riding up hills, like, you know, sort of climbing yeah. and, uh, just sort of really sort of pulled my hip flexors. So I've been sort of taking a break and I, and so I have to do a lot of like just flat road riding to kind of let everything get back into yeah. shape. And, and I just like, it just, I don't want to ride my rope, my mountain bike on the, you know, my knobby wheeled mountain bike with the wrong gear set on a yeah yeah no like, you do uh. not eight island last time i went to a restaurant last night you must be on new zealand or something yeah um let's see <sighs> oh, there was like thank you our instro for contributing bits to the annie gets a dog cam what what is that so, so if people don't, I'm trying to figure out all of the different things that are going on. They reset our Twitch channel, by which I mean other people who were gleefully involved and I vaguely paid en not enough attention. So I think it's you donate channel points, but our instro donated actual bits as well. And the goal is to get it so that when Annie's streaming, she also has a camera pointed just at her doggos that are better behaved than mine and will sit in one place and, and happily try and steal the souls of people on the other side of the camera so that they will donate bits, which get the dog's treats. Hmm. Yes. That sounds very complicated. <laughs> I don't understand Twitch, clearly. It's it's okay. There's a lot more silly on Twitch. Have you have you been playing around with Clubhouse at all? I know I see your name on there. I, I installed it and then became intimidated and ran away. It, it's kind of amazing that you go there and you're like, oh, Will I Am and I don't know, Elon Musk are having a conversation right now and you could listen. Or um like it's just celebrity after celebrity. It's it's, and so like on the one hand, it's you're like, wow, these are it's kind of amazing who is involved in this. The fairly big names. Yeah. And on the other hand, it just feels kind of exclusionary, and and I don't like it. And it's like a podcast that you can't pause, that you yeah. can't record, um, that is kind of freeform nonsense. And and people talking over top of each other. And, and so it's like a bad podcast filled with really sort of impressive, very important people. Like it, to, to me, it felt like stepping in to a very exclusive dinner party where I wasn't supposed to speak. Yes. Yeah. So apparently Twitter is already rolling out their version of this. Um, uh, there's going to be, I'm sure... Within months, there will be a version of this for every major social platform out there. Mark, mark my words. So, I, I wouldn't feel too bad if you don't have access to Clubhouse yet, and because it's it's weird. It's super weird. Yeah, like yeah. I said, I logged in, became intimidated, and ran away. Yeah, yeah. No, you can like listen to stuff. Dusty Rice one saying so. It's like internet radio. No, it's it's. It's, it's live. It, it's live. It's like a chat room, like yeah. a like a voice channel on on Discord, 
where people are talking to each other about various topics. So people drop in and some of them, they're just kind of going on all the time or in other cases, mm -hmm. people who are organizing it will set the, the topic and the time and sort of decide fairly carefully who can and can't talk. And, and like, I'm not lying. Like the, 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 the caliber of the people who are on the system right now are the, are like, Carla was like, Oh, here's a uh, dead mouse talking about the music industry. Yeah. And you're like, huh, that's weird. And a bunch of other people or whatever. Here's Lex Friedman talking yeah. about some of his interviews. So the people are very interesting. The conversations are very interesting, but it's also kind of a bad format. It also kind of makes it so people can't join. And so it's, yeah, I'm, uh, I, overall, I'm not impressed. But, but I'll keep trying. And I'm, overall, I want to see this just rolled out in ways that, that everybody can access it because the, the fact that you, like what I would love to do is I would love to organize a bunch of great debates. I would love to or yeah, organize that a series cool. of, like this is, this is the kind of thing that I do. This is my specialty. And so I would bring in a bunch of astronomers to discuss really interesting topics like, people who think dark matter, it's a, it, different explanations of what they think dark matter is or different explanations about what they think um, uh, dark energy is or, you know, whatever. Let's have a series of great debates. Oh, but I can't get the astronomers that I want because I can't get them onto Clubhouse because I don't have enough invites or they use Android. Yeah. I um, can't get everyone to listen to it because... That because nobody has invites, so do I record it? Do I, right? I'm doing a really interesting thing, and no one can no one can listen yeah. to it. That's that's how that yeah. would play out, and I don't like that. So I know, I know. It's I think your Discord model is is a good way of thinking of it. Well, and that's what I was thinking was okay. Well, let's just do this on Discord. We'll just do this yeah. on Discord, and then record them, and then make them available, and that way. You can kind of do the same thing, except it's you freely available. You can do exactly available. the same thing. You can do exactly thing. the same thing, except you yeah. make it. Anyone who wants to be a part of it can be a part of it. I think that's yeah. the right model. It's just that this has star power and and you don't have to go through all the administrative whatever. So I think right. that's the way I'm going. Horizon Brave says, no, no, you're thinking too small, Fraser. I Richard don't think Dawkins. anyone's ever said that yeah, to, yeah, to you, Fraser. Yeah, that's that's hard to no, I, any anyone. I mean, you can have any all kinds of of guests be a part of it. It'd be fun. But anyway, we've reached the end of our hour. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for watching us today. Thank you, Pamela, for bringing the brain. Thank you to all our moderators, all the viewers, both on YouTube and on Twitch. We couldn't do this without you. We will see all of you Friday now. Is that right? Is yeah. That the plan? Friday. Okay. Yeah. We'll see all of you on Friday. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Stop the stream. Hold on. <laughs> and suddenly both the dogs came in. Hi there.